Shalom, shalom. My name is Mateus Guimarães. I am the Vice President of Teaching from Zion Ministry, which has its headquarters in Brazil, in the city of Belo Horizonte, and also in Israel. Our ministry is dedicated to the restoration of Israel, as well as the restoration of the church. We are composed by Jews and non-Jews, but both believe that Yeshua is the Messiah of Israel. And so we have a commitment towards Israel to present the Jewish Messiah to the Jewish people. And we also have the purpose of helping the church to find its roots, find it once again, because the church was born in Jerusalem, in Israel. But whatever roots there were there, they were taken out of the bosom of the church. So we want to help the church, help believers all over the world to reconnect to Israel and to understand the scriptures in its original context, Jewish context. The topic that we chose to teach uh, now for you that are watching this study is a very important topic. And I believe it's very, uh, it's, it's important because it, it faces a situation that we are going on now in the world. You know, anti-Semitism is growing all over the place, uh, especially in Christian circles. So we are all aware of movements like the BDS, the boycott uh, against products made in Israel. And, but this boycott, it's not only of merchandising, of, of products. It, it goes beyond. It, it has a theological effect as well. And we want to fight that. And we want to present now the topic of this message, which is the importance of Israel for the return of the Messiah. So is Israel important for the return of Yeshua, of the Messiah? So we will explain and we'll dig in this topic now. I want to uh, start telling you that if Israel has any importance to the believers today, when I say Israel, I don't mean the uh, concept of spiritual Israel. That is a concept very problematic. Uh, so we don't use it very much. Actually, I don't use it at all because I believe that Israel is Israel. And, uh, and also the Apostle Paul believes that Israel is, is Israel. But there is a remnant of Israel. And this Israel has a purpose given by God that needs and will be fulfilled. So let's check according to the scriptures what will be the importance of Israel. Before we talk about the importance of Israel for the return of Yeshua, the Messiah, let's talk about the importance of Israel for the church, for those that serve God, the God of Israel, and His Son, Yeshua, but are not Jews. Uh, we start, I want you to open your Bible in, in the book of Romans, uh, chapter 3. A very special rabbi named Shaul, or Paul, gives a teaching to a community that from the beginning was faced with the spirit of anti-Semitism, theological anti-Semitism. That is called supersessionism. Supersessionism is the idea that Israel was superseded, was replaced by the church, by the Gentile group, uh, part of the church. So they replaced Israel regarding the promises, regarding the election, regarding the uh, future prophecies, Israel was replaced, okay? And this community in Rome, they developed from very early stages a type of antisemitism, of supersessionism, a type of replacement theology. And Paul is going to fight that in the book of Romans to teach this community that Israel has a very special place in the eyes of God. That although some part of the Jewish people, some, some, some Jews, although a big part of, of Israel in y y Jesus, Yeshua's time, did not accept him as, as Messiah, but we read in the scriptures that thousands and thousands followed him, okay, and accepted him as, 
as the Messiah. But part of Israel did not accept him. And Paul is going to explain that this rejection was also planned by God. It was prophetic. It was planned by God because this way the gospel, the good news, would be spread out towards the nations. It will come out from Israel and it will reach the nations by that rejection. Not the rejection of the Jewish people by God, but the rejection of the Jews regarding the gospel. And that's temporary. Also, Paul is going to quote some, some prophecies that this rejection is temporary. Okay? So let's analyze some of the texts. Romans chapter 3, from verse 1, I will um, show here in the uh, PowerPoint presentation. So if you, you are watching this uh, study, you can also follow. So let's see the first uh, quotation from Romans chapter 3. It says like this. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. So this is a very important verse. This is an amazing verse. Paul is asking the question as a rabbi, and he's answering. Okay, What advantage does the Jew have? This was a, 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 a probably a question being asked by the Romans. If Paul is addressing this issue, they were asking this kind of question. What advantage Israel has? I mean, they rejected the Messiah. You know. They're, 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 they're facing, they're under occupation. They're under Roman occupation. You know, they're humiliated. The leadership of Israel rejected Yeshua, so they don't deserve anything. What advantage do, do they have? You know? What importance do they have? So Paul answers that much in every way. I love this expression. Much in every way. Because to them were committed the oracles of God, the prophets of God, the voice of God, the will of God. God reveals himself to humanity through Israel. If you want to know God, if you want to know who is God, you have to analyze and study the history of Israel. Because Israel was supposed to be a nation with the main purpose of reflecting God's glory, God's presence. So God chose Israel to reveal himself to the world. And that revelation was not fulfilled only with the coming of, of, of Yeshua, of Jesus. That revelation continues to go. And there are many promises that involve uh, involves Israel. Still to be fulfilled. Okay? So Paul answers this question. Does, does the Jew have any advantage? Yes. Much in every way. Because they were chosen by God. And the revelations that God gave to them is a very important revelation. You know, The history that God has with them is, is, is how you understand God. Okay? So, but there is another uh, passage from the same book of Romans. Now Paul is getting more into the subject. Now he's starting to uh, fight, you know. Sometimes I, when, I, when I study uh, Paul, especially in the book of Romans, I remember those old, those old uh, kung fu movies, you know. I don't know if you're familiar with these, these movies, especially Bruce Lee movies from the, <laughs> from the late 60s and 70s. One of his movies, Bruce Lee enters a Japanese dojo, you know, and he, uh, he confronts the whole class of Japanese judo students, and they start a fight, and he was alone in the place. A Japanese training place full of Japanese, and he was the only Chinese, and they start a fight. And Bruce Lee, the way he fights is very interesting. He he kicks one here, he kicks one back there, he punches one here, he jumps and, and, and hit one other there, and he doesn't stop. Every time he's hitting in one direction, he's protecting himself, he's blocking, you know, and, and hitting at the same time, but in many directions. Same thing for me is in the book of Romans. Paul is dealing with a lot of subjects that he needs to confront and he needs to hit back. He needs to uh, give a, a, a counter-argument. And he does that in the book of Romans. So in, in, in chapter 3, he's dealing about the, the, the advantage. You know, what advantage does the Jew have? Now in chapter 9, he's getting more 
uh, into the subject. He's getting deeper. And open now in Romans chapter 9 from verses 3 to 5. And I will show it here for you to read with me. Paul is speaking about Israelites, okay? Paul is speaking about Jews that have not yet received Yeshua as their Messiah. So these are non-believing Jews, non-believing in Yeshua, okay? So the argument goes like this. They are Israelites. To whom pertain the adoption? This verb is a very, it's not a, it's an ancient form, but, but pertain. I mean, it, it's, it's, it belongs to them, okay? It belongs to them. What belongs to them? The adoption. This is, this is, this is fantastic. I mean, they, they, the adoption was given to them. What is adoption? To be the daughter or son of someone. So they were given the promise the covenant to be God's people. Israel in the desert is called by God my firstborn. Jeremiah chapter 2 calls Israel my bride. These are very important expressions. They are not, you know, floating over by chance in the Bible. They have a meaning. And Paul is... Paul is using these this verses to teach these Romans that although the Israel that you see that have rejected Yeshua, I mean, they are not, not they, they did not receive the good news, but although, in spite of the fact that they did not receive the good news, they are still, they still have the adoption. It's theirs. But not only that. To them pertain the glory. You see? The glory. The character of God, His glory, His power, His mercy is shown by the history of Israel. You analyze Israel, you see God's glory. God is manifested inside the Jewish people, in, in, in Jewish history. The covenants, and, 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 and in plural, you see here, covenants, it's more than one. To them belong the covenants. And I would include here the new covenant as well. The new covenant was given to Israel, not to the church, not to the Gentiles. It, were, it was given to, the, to Israel, and to the house of Israel, and to the house of Judah. You just have to open your Bible in Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, and you will see very uh, 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 clear, an explanation, a revelation to the prophet of what was going to be the new covenant. And the new covenant was going to be made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. And this new covenant was about getting the Torah, God's law, the instructions of God, taking it out of stones and putting it in people's heart. And in people's mind. The same law. The law is not abolished. The law is taken from the stones and planted in our hearts. It becomes part of our nature. That's what it means. Okay? So, the, you can tell me the, the Abrahamic, Abrahamic covenant, the Sinai covenant, you know, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant as well. All belongs to the Jews according to Paul. To them belongs the giving of the law. The law was given to Israel. Israel was supposed to reveal it to the world, to live it out, to give a testimony of, of the law so other nations could imitate, could emulate. To them belong the service of God, all the liturgies, all the psalms, you know, the psalms, the, 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 the prophecies. The praises belongs to them, belongs to their history. And the promises of whom are the fathers. And I would say that Paul is telling the Romans there that the patriarchs of the Jewish people, they have to be the patriarchs 
of the Gentile believers. If they believe in God, they become sons and daughters of Abraham. So Abraham is not only the, the father of the Jewish people, he's also your father as well in the faith. Abraham, Abraham, Abraham has to be your father. If you want to belong to the kingdom, Abraham, Abraham has to be your father. There's no place in the kingdom of God for people that are not sons of Abraham. Only the uh, sons of Abra Abraham have entrance to the kingdom of God. So either you are a son of Abraham through blood, or you are a son of Israel through faith, then you, are, you can be part of the kingdom of God. So that's why Paul is saying here that, that, that their, their fathers, their forefathers, are also your forefathers in the faith. And, and, and these forefathers belong to them. God gave patriarchs to the Jewish people, Abraham, Isaac, Yaakov, you know, Yosef, the tribes of Israel. It was given to them. And from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came, who is over all the eternally blessed God. Amen. So this is clear that not only all of these things belongs to the Jews. You see, it's not, it, it doesn't belong to the church. The church can co-participate. The church can have access to all of this. And Paul is not denying that. We all have access to these things. But we have access to these things through the grafting in the Jewish people. We were, the, those that were not Jews were grafted in the people of Israel, the people of God. So they can also have access to these promises, to these covenants, to this glory, to this history, you see. Through Yeshua, the God of Israel becomes your God. If you're not Jewish, okay? But through Yeshua, through the Messiah, the God of Israel becomes your God. The father, the patriarchs of Israel, become, they become your patriarchs, okay? Abraham is your father. The kings of Israel, they become your kings. David is your king as well. The prophets of Israel become your prophets. They prophesy to you as well. So all of those things, all of, those, all of this treasure that was given to Israel is accessible for those that are not Jews, but they, they are grafted in through the work of Mashiach, to the through the sacrifice of Yeshua. Well, there's another teaching now from Romans 11. I know you are familiar with this passage, but let's check it out. Here, Romans chapter 11, more about this topic. See, now, if their fall, their fall is riches of the world. I mean, he's, 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 he's mentioning this is about the Jewish people having rejected, part of the Jewish people having rejected the gospel. If their fall, the rejection that they had against the uh, gospel, if this rejection resulted in riches for the world. This is amazing. Paul here is doing a mathematic law, a math law, the law of proportionality. If their fall or their rejection, I mean, their, the fact that they rejected the gospel, may the gospel go to many, many places, you know. What would happen when the same people get into their fullness, when they fulfill their purpose? You see, if their mistake is, 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 mentioned, is mentioned here by Paul, their mistake as riches of the world. What if they do right? You see, proportion. If you see, it, it's proportional. Look, if if their fall is riches of to the for the world and their failure riches for the Gentiles, this is amazing. How much more 
their fullness will be. And he answers the question. For if they're being cast away is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? This is what Paul is trying to explain to those Gentiles, those believers in Rome, non-Jewish believers. It's proportional. There are promises that God will reveal himself to the Jewish people as a nation. I will check that later in this study. And the church needs to help Israel to get into this fulfillment. Have to pray, have to love the Jewish people. I mean, not Jews that don't believe in Yeshua yet. You have to pray for this group. You have to, you have to love them. It, it's, it's, a, it's a mitzvah, it's a commandment to love the Jewish people, according to Paul in chapter 11. The church has an obligation, it's mandatory, to love, to support, to help, financially even, the, the Jewish believers. Because when they reach their promises, this will result in life from the dead. What will that be, life from the dead? Some theologians says, say that this is just a uh, big revival. Okay, but it's still something good, no? It still, still is something good. Life from the dead, a great revival like never seen before in the history of the church. When this will, revival will happen, will take place when the Jews enter their fullness. Some people say that this life from the dead means resurrection, literally. That's also a good thing because we know when is going to be a resurrection announced in the Scriptures, promised in the Scriptures. When Yeshua, when the Messiah comes back, when He comes back, there will be resurrection, okay? So if this text is, if this text is alluding to, to the return of the Messiah, so now we have it. He comes when His people enter its fullness. It's amazing. And we don't have time to explore more about Romans, but read in your house in Romans chapter 11 to 12. You will see amazing explanations supporting the Jewish people, fighting anti-Semitism, fighting uh, theological anti-Semitism, fighting supersessionism, fighting replacement theology. Paul is, argu uh, is arguing against these things. Same arguments that myself as a Jew face every day. I face those arguments every day. You know, it, it, sometimes people don't pay attention in what Paul writes. Well, so we saw some points and we showed why Israel is important to the church. Now, why Israel is important to the redemption of the world, to the coming of the Messiah? Because when Messiah comes, redemption will take place. Tikkun olam. A restoration of all things. The world will, will be restored. Does the Jewish people play any important role in this tikkun olam, in this restoration of all things? Does the Jewish people have any function? Are they important to bring this into fulfillment, this restoration of all things? Are they important for the return of the Messiah, which is the topic of our study? So, so now, now let's open our Bibles in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. And I know you know this verse, but we, but we have to explain it, go deeper in this, these uh, words of God to King Shlom Shlomo Solomon. King Solomon was dedicating the temple in, in Jerusalem, in Mount Moriah. He prayed to God that God would bless him and bless the, the, the temple, that God will uh, dwell, that his name will, would dwell in that place that he built, that his father envisioned, and he built. 
And God answers the king. Okay? So 2 Chronicles chapter 7 from verse 12, it says like this. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people in the situation of tribulation, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. This is amazing as well. And you see, there is a principle here. What is the principle? It's a spiritual law, okay? It's a spiritual law. What is the law? The law is, in times of tribulation, in difficult times, whenever the people of God will humble themselves and pray and seek God's face and turn from their wicked ways, God will hear from heaven, forgive the sin, and heal the land. This is a principle. It works in every place of the world. Okay? It's not restricted, specific to Israel. It works everywhere, and I've seen it. I've seen it. If God's people get together, unite, pray, repent, turn from their wicked ways, God will listen from heaven and will forgive the sin and will heal the land. Okay? Right. But the fact that this principle works, you cannot steal from Israel, you cannot take it out from Israel, the special place that Israel has. Because to them, this promise was given. Although you can apply it in every nation, you cannot deny that the promise was given and is still in effect. This promise is still in effect. In Israel. And when it happens in Israel, it has a cosmological effect. It has a universal effect. It's a bomb. A good bomb. A good bomb. When this thing happened in Israel... There is forgiving of sins and there is healing of the land. An interesting thing here, thing here in this uh, passage is the, uh, the words chosen by God that if my people were called by my name, you know, this is very interesting. Because the Jews, Israel carries the name of God. Wherever Israel goes, she takes with her the name of God. And that's why we were punished so many times. That's why we were punished so many times. Because when we go to the nations and we follow after false gods, we are taking with us the name of God. And the name of God is humiliated. We bring shame to the name of God that we carry. And God punishes us. But w what is this thing that, 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 that we carry the name of God? You know, What is this? People that are called by my name. Does God have a name? Yes, of course. He has hundreds of names. He's called Elohim. He's called Adonai. The Lord. He's called El Shaddai. He's called uh, El Gibor. He's called El Elion. He has many names, Mateus. Yes. But he also has a name. One name. A name. 
the name that he chooses to reveal himself to Moses. Okay? And that name reveals the identity, the character of God. It's a name that Jews do not pronounce today. It's a tetragram. Four letters, four consonants that form the name of God. It's the name of God. He has a name. Let's analyze something here. These people that are called by his name that we will see now, what is his name? If these people pray, and, and it's interesting because the, the verb here in, in Hebrew to pray is lehit palel. Lehit, lehit palel means to mediate, to intercede, to mediate, okay? And that's the very uh, role of Israel, isn't it? When God formed Israel, it was taking Israel out of, the de- of, out, of the, out of Egypt, through the desert. God tells them in Exodus chapter 19 that Israel is supposed to be a nation, a kingdom of priests. Mamlechet koanim in Hebrew. A, a, a kingdom of priests. Not only the tribe of Levi. Not only the sons of Aaron. The whole people, the whole nation was chosen to be a kingdom of priests. A holy nation. Goy Kodesh. So it's in, it's, it, it is in the very nature of the Jew to be a representative of God to the nations. To teach the nations how to worship God. How to, to reach God. You know? How to express, how to, how to understand God. Israel is also called light to the nations, you see. And the Messiah is also called light to the nations because the Messiah reflects all of the aspects of Israel. It's, there are all of the responsibilities of Israel, they can be seen in Messiah's character, in Messiah's life, in Yeshua's life. So, so Yeshua is the light to the nations. Yeshua is the, the Jew that keeps on, that, that, keep, that keeps fulfilling Israel's responsibilities. Yeshua is, a represent, is the best representative of the people of Israel. He's the best, most famous Jew, Jew that have ever lived. His name is Yeshua. Some people call him Jesus, okay, but his name was Yeshua. Jesus was a transliteration, transliteration from from. from from Hebrew to Greek to Latin. It's the same person, don't worry, it's the same person, okay? But his name was uh, Yeshua. He's, a rep- he's the best representative of God. He's the best representative of Israel. Israel spent, spent 40 years in the desert. How many days Yeshua spent in the desert before his ministry? 40. Israel was called from Egypt. Where was Yeshua called also? He went to Egypt with his, with his uh, mother and father. You know. So it's many, uh, many things parallel with uh, the life of the Messiah and the life of Israel. So, people that are called by my name. In Hebrew, it's a very interesting expression. It's, uh, um, the people, asher nikra shmi aleihem. Asher nikra shmi alehem. That, if, if we translate that literally, it will be something like, the people who my name is proclaimed over them. The people that carries my name in, in their nature, in their very being, they carry my name. Even if they're not aware, they carry it anyways. Okay? And if we analyze the Hebrew term, the Hebrew terms for, if you analyze the name of God, and the name of, 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 of the Jew, of, of, of Judah, we will see how connected those two are. God is connected to his people. God is faithful to his people, to his, to his promises made to his people. Starting in the name. Let's see. Look. This is a picture of Mount Moriah in the 10th century B.C. 
ok? BCE, before common era. Maybe in the times of King Solomon, I don't know. But Solomon was the one that expanded the walls to include Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is right here to the top right, ok? You see the temple here in the top right? There's the temple that he built. And he expanded the walls to go around Mount Moriah. Mount Moriah is this mountain here to the right, okay? And on the bottom, we'll have, you have Mount Zion and the city of Jerusalem, okay? So, this is Mount Moriah, and this is a very special place, you know? Mount Moriah is a very special place. Because the promise, the promise that God gave to Israel includes the place, includes the people, it has to be the Jewish people. and has to be in the place that he has chosen. So there are two mandatory re uh, 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 requests. You know, two requests that needs to be addressed. It has to be the people that are called by God's name. One. And it has to be in the place. They have to pray and they have to repent. They have to... palel In the place that God has chosen. For his, the dwelling of his name, okay, which is Mount Moriah. If we, an, if, we, if we analyze the name Moriah, Moriah in Hebrew, okay, there's also something very special because this mountain was the same mountain that centuries before the father of the Jewish people took his only son to be sacrificed. Abraham took Isaac to Mount Moriah. To the place that God would show him. So it was already a place known in ancient times where God is revealed, where, where God the Creator is revealed. Before God reveals Himself to Israel, He was known as God the Creator, the only God, the Creator. But within Israel, He starts a relationship. He gets more intimate with, with the Jewish people. So He reveals Himself in other aspects as well. You know, He's known by other attributes. Elohim, El Elyon, El Shaddai. Huh? So we have many uh, names. But let's, let's analyze Moriah, okay? This is how it's written in Hebrew, Moriah. The Hebrew we read from right to left. So we have the letter Mem, M, uh, Resh, R, Yud, that's the I, and uh, letter He, okay? So Moriah, according to some Research, according to some theologians, it's not just a name. Moriah reveals an identity. See, a name in the Hebrew Bible is not just a name. It's not the way you call things. A name reveals the identity of the thing, of the person. So when you, when you, when you, come, when you analyze, when you read a name in the Scriptures... You have to analyze what it means in the, in the original language, in the original Hebrew. Moriah is maybe a combination of some words. Maybe it's an acronym. Look, the mem comes from makom. Makom in Hebrew is place. You see here, mem. The resh comes from re, to see. The yud he, the, the last two letters of the name Moriah, yud and he, comes from what? The name of God. I, I wrote it here. This one here is the name of God, yud he, vav he. It's a tetragram. It's the unpronounceable name. It's the most important name of the Bible. It's God's name. Okay? So Moriah would mean what? Makom re'e Adonai. The place where God is seen. And he has this name. We don't know who created this name, who gave this name. But the name existed in the times of Abraham. The place was already known by being a place where God is manifested. Moriah. So the place is also important. Very important. For what we'll see now. Well... You know about Moriah, that is an important place, you know. And God has not replaced this place. 
God has not rejected. God has not uh, corrected his words to Solomon, you know. And said, oh, you know that promise that I gave you, it's not like that anymore, you know. Uh, the, place is, you, the, place become, the place has become a very uh, problematic place, you know. Now you have uh, weird neighbors and um, it's too much violence, you know. I will not reveal myself anymore in that place. I will choose another place. Maybe a hill in Switzerland or, uh, you know, a mountain in Peru or something like this, because it's, it's, it's more calm. You know, there today it became a very uh, problematic place. But this is the place today. That's Mount Moriah. The wall here that you see, it's called in Hebrew, Kote Lamaravi, and the uh, Western Wall. And uh, some Christians call it the Wailing Wall, but we Jews don't call it like that. You know, it's the place of prayer. Because it's, it's the closest we get to the temple, the, 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 the Solomon's temple, okay? And this wall here was built by Herod, the king, the great Herod, the king. And what Herod did was he leveled the top of the mountain, the tip of the mountain. He leveled by building four walls around it and putting earth. So he leveled the top, the tip of the mountain and the... Uh, and it's a very special place, you know. It's a very special place. Folks, I know God answers prayers everywhere. Here in Brazil, God answers my prayers here. I don't have to go to Mount Moriah to have my prayers answered. But I know about the symbolism of this place. I know about how special this place is for God. And I know about the prophetic implications that this place have. Okay? What prophetic implications? If the Jewish people, people who are called by the, name of, by the name of God, if they get together here in this Mount Moriah, in this place where God revealed himself to the world, and if they pray, and if they repent, and if they turn from their wicked ways, God will listen from heaven because he promised that he, his ears and eyes will be open forever in this place. He's waiting for this moment. And whenever this moment occurs, whenever this moment happens, he will hear from heaven, he will forgive the sins, and he will heal the land. And it maybe it's not only the land of Israel. Maybe it's the whole planet. We need healing. The world needs healing today. The world is collapsing. Look, the system of the world is collapsing. Our society is collapsing, especially the Western society. We are collapsing. So we need this more than ever. A healing, restoration of the people and restoration of the land. Okay? Well, now let's analyze something like this. Jewish people is called by God, people who are called by my name. You know, the Jews are called people that are called by my name. And there is great restoration power when this people cries out in the place chosen by God. I showed you that, okay? It's a bomb, a good bomb. It's an atomic bomb, positive way. Because it has the power to heal the land. It has the power to forgive sins. It has the power to start in our society, something never seen before. A revolution. A revival like never seen before. The Spirit of God, the Ruach, being poured out. The people of God, you know. Anyways, why is the Jewish people called people who are called by the name of God? Let's analyze this. This is the name of God from Exodus chapter 3, verse 15, a revelation that God gave to Moses. God revealed himself to Moses by his name, not by his attributes. This revelation was given to Moses, and it, the name of God has four consonants, four letters. yud Hey vav Hey. I wrote them here in yellow color. 
And uh, some translations say it's uh, Jehovah, 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 Yahweh, Yah. I saw many uh, transliterations of this name, but there are no translations. Because this name is actually, in my opinion, and I have many rabbis that think also like this, that this name is also an acronym. It's an abbreviation. Because what name could you give God that would not limit him? A name limits a person, right? A name limits the nature of a person. What name could we give God that would not limit him? Limit him. This name. This name is the junction, is the combination of the three times of the verb to be in Hebrew. The Yud stands for Iye. The He and the Vav stays for Hove. And the last He stands for Haya. Iye, Hove, Haya. The one that was, the one that is, and the one that will be. If you get the to be verb in Hebrew, past, present, and future, you have the name of God. So the only translation that we could give to this name is eternal. Because if he was, if he is, and he will be, he's eternal. That's the only name you can give God that you not, do not limit to him. It's very interesting. But it's just an, a theory, okay? It's not a dogma. It's not, I'm, not, I'm not being dogmatic here. I'm just speaking something that I think is very interesting about the nature of the name of God. So let's check now about this is the name of God and this is how we write Judah in Hebrew. Take a look. I wrote here Yehuda, Judah. Okay? A Jew is the one that is from Judah. Okay? So, what, what we see here, we see that the name Jew or Judah has in it the name of God, you see? Same letters. Look. Yud, He, Vav. There's a D here in the name that the name of God doesn't have. Okay? A letter Dalit in Hebrew. And the He. So the name of God is inside the name of the people. That's why God calls them the people who are called by my name. They have God's name in them. Even in the name. They, they carry the, the name of God. But what is this Dalit here, this letter D? What can it be? Uh, many rabbis say that uh, it can be the Dalit from... Dalit means door. Dalit means door. Okay. Dalit means David. David, who is the image of the Messiah. I mean, it's the Messiah was called according to David. David was a prototype of, of a, a Messiah. So maybe the letter D here in the name Yehuda means what? Maybe the letter D here means David, the door. Yeshua, the Messiah. Okay. So the people of God carry the name of God and they carry the door. This is very interesting, folks. Because, because according to Paul, even Yeshua himself comes from the Jews. So the Jews have David, the Jews have Yeshua, the Jews have the Messiah. The Messiah was not promised to the United States. The Messiah was promised to Israel. He's called the Lion of the tribe of Judah. So he's a Jew. He was not a Jew. He is a Jew. He still is a Jew. So even the salvation in Yeshua, in Jesus, depends on the Jewish people because the Jewish people are the door. The knowing, the knowledge of the Messiah comes from the Jews. The scriptures, they come from the Jews. All these things that we read in Romans chapter 9. Now, this is the name of God and it's a very important name. And we know that one other person and one place are also called 
by this name. It's very interesting. There's an expression in Hebrew called Adonai Sitkenu. Adonai, I mean the, 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 this name, okay? When I say Adonai, I mean uh, this name here. Adonai Tzitkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. One person, one other person, not God, one other person, and one place are called Adonai Tzitkenu. Why? Because they manifest, they, they, they express God's presence. So they're called the Lord, our, our righteousness. The righteousness of God can be seen in this person and in this place. That's why the person and the place are called Adonai Tzitkenu. The first one that is called Adonai Tzitkenu is Yeshua, the Messiah. In Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. Jeremiah 23, I will read briefly. Verses 5 and 6, look. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. That I will raise to David a branch of righteousness, and a king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell safely. Now, this is his name by which he will be called Adonai yud hei vav hei the Lord our righteousness. So Yeshua, the Messiah, is called by the name of God because he, he, he manifests God's glory. God's name, God's righteousness can be seen in him, in his works, in his speak, uh, uh, preaching, in his teachings, in his life. The other one that is called the mighty Canu, if you go a little further, Jeremiah 33, chapter, uh, chapter 33, Verse 14, it says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will perform the good things which I have promised to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause to grow up to David a branch of righteousness. Again, he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell safely. And this is the name by which she will be called. Adonai Tzidkenu, the city of Jerusalem. Why is the city of Jerusalem called Adonai Tzidkenu, the Lord our righteousness? Because in Jerusalem, the glory of God will be seen. In Jerusalem, the manifestations of God will be seen again. The righteousness, the power, the glory of God. They can already be seen, but they will be seen in a much higher, bigger scale. Well, so let's summarize now. Look. Let's read here. The people who carries the name of God received a promise that the promise to be, to be filled with His Spirit. That's another promise that Israel received. Israel as a nation will be filled with the Spirit of God. This reality, when the Jewish people be filled, when they would be filled with the Spirit of God, that will start a national revelation about the identity of the Messiah. The Jewish people will see who Yeshua is. And when that day comes, when they are Filled with the Spirit of, the God, of God, when they realize who Yeshua is, this moment will be followed by a national cry for His return. This, this is so simple to understand. There is a promise that Israel as a nation will be filled with the Spirit of God. God will pour out His Spirit because He promised. Before they know the Messiah, before they know who Yeshua is, they will be filled with the Spirit of God. No other nation in the world, in the history of humanity, received such a promise. The only nation with promise of, with, of salvation is the Jewish people, according to the prophets. They will be filled with the Spirit of God. Then they will realize who Yeshua is. This is a very interesting passage that we will read now. And when they realize who Yeshua is and what, 
we did to him, we will cry. We will repent. Where will we, we will repent? Where will we repent? In Mount Moriah, in Israel. This revelation will be done, will be uh, uh, concluded, will be done in Israel. When the Jewish people, with the Spirit of God, realizes who Yeshua is, and they cry out in Mount Moriah, in Israel, they cry out as a nation, God, forgive us. God, we did wrong. We did not know. And according to Isaiah, God himself blocked the eyes of the Jewish people so they would not see, neither hear. So the word, the gospel, could go out of to the nations. But there is a time then when God will remove the scales from the eyes, will remove whatever is blocking the, the, the hearing, and they will see, and they will read Moses, and the veil, you remember the veil? The veil that Paul, the veil that, that, that they put over Moses so he will not shine and, and, and overshine over people, this veil will be removed. And in the law, in the Torah, they will see who? Yeshua. In the prophets, they will realize who Yeshua is. Then they will repent. Then they will cry out. And this is a very interesting passage. Your, turn your Bible in Zechariah chapter 12. And let's read. In that day, the Lord will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among them in that day shall be like David. And the house of David shall be like God. This is amazing. The house of David will be like God. And the weakest among them will be like David. You know, look up of what this thing represents. And the house of David shall be like God, like the angel of the Lord before them. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. And the spirit of supplication. And then they will look on me. In Hebrew I wrote there. Ve hibitu elai. They will look to me whom they pierced. And they will mourn for him. As one mourns for his only son. And they will grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. This is amazing. The grammar in Hebrew, the author did not, made a did not make a mistake. It's like that. They will look to me. People will be searching for God. I, I need you to understand that. And these days, I believe there will be days of tribulations, of problems in Israel. Like never before. And this will force the Jewish people to seek for God. And within this search... They will look to him. They will look to his words. They will look in his words. They will, they will go after him. And in this moment, they will look to me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn for him. You understand this? By searching for God, by searching for the truth, God will reveal his son to his people. Because on this day, they will look to God and they will grieve and they will mourn. As one who mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. What do you think will happen when this happens? Can you make a parallel between this text and Second Chronicles? It's the same situation. People will be praying. People will be looking for God. People will be repenting. It's Jewish people in Israel. And this will initiate a cosmological explosion. Because they will recognize who Yeshua was and who Yeshua is. And they will what? They will ask for his return. That's the key. That's the key for the return of Yeshua. When the Jewish people, 
with his spirit, with this revelation, cry out for Yeshua, repenting and inviting him to come back. But this time, not as a traitor. This time, not as a bastard like he was treated when he was here 2,000 years ago. Not as a mamzer in Hebrew, but as a melech, as a king. When the Jewish people in Israel invites him to come back as their king, he will come back. Why? How do I know that? Because Yeshua him, his, himself said that. Look. Yeshua himself declared that he will only return to Jerusalem when Jerusalem receives him as a king. He will not come back uninvited. He will come back whenever he is invited to come as her king. Look. He speaks to Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. You see, your house is left, left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more. Until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is a promise. And we often ignore the prerogative. We ignore the conditions for Yeshua's return. I see churches all over the world. I see Jews all over the world, you know, praying for the, for the coming of the Messiah. Or in the case of Israel, coming for, praying for the coming of the Messiah. The church is praying for the return. The Israel is praying for, for him to come. Okay? But if, if, if Yeshua is the Messiah, which I believe he is, he gave a very simple and explicit condition here. He will only return when Israel, when Jerusalem receives him back as a king and invites him back. Baruch Abba B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of of God. That's the key for the return of the Lord. That's the key of the global redemption. That's the key for Tikkun Olam is when the Jewish people receives Yeshua as their Messiah. Apostle Paul says that uh, the church, the Gentile church, they need to uh, provoke the Jews to jealousy, right? Provoke to jealousy. The church needs to provoke Israel to jealousy. The church has provoked everything on the Jews except jealousy. They have created terror, intimidation, fear, but not jealousy. But the time will come when God will speak to his church. And this is already happening. People from all over the world, from different denominations, different backgrounds, Believers, followers of God, disciples of Yeshua, they are turning back to the Bible. They are turning back to Jerusalem. They are turning back to Israel as the heirs of such promises and such responsibilities. And when this happens, when the church intercedes and when the church love, when they love Israel, when they intercede for Israel, this will generate a movement in heaven. That will cause this revelation to take place. That's the role of the church. Love, support, intercede, pray for the Jewish people. Most of all, help the Jewish believers. Because we were the ones that are the bridges. We are the bridges. We are connecting uh, our people back to, 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 to their Messiah. We are connecting the church back to its roots. And a bridge is supposed to be stepped on. It's a very difficult situation. It's a very difficult position to be. We are attacked by Christian believers. Unfortunately, we are attacked by Christian believers, by being Messianic Jews. We are attacked by our Jewish relatives who are not believers yet. They attack us, uh, accuse us uh, of, of traitors, being traitors, because we are disciples of Yeshua. So we need the, the, the understanding of the church to pray for us, to help us, help us. 
paying this bridge, taking Yeshua back to his people. You know, Yeshua spent too much time in the diaspora, in the Galut. We need to take him back to home, his house. We need to take him back home. He wants to go back home. Okay. So we end this presentation saying in Hebrew what we pray that Israel will say to him. And this day is coming. Folks, there are about one million Jews that are disciples of Yeshua today. There are more Jews disciples of Yeshua today than in the days of Yeshua himself 2,000 years ago. So this is prophetic. And we are growing. And more and more churches are understanding their Jewish roots and they are restoring this relationship to Israel. So we all say in Hebrew, Baruch Haba B'Shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of God. Amen. May God bless all of you. Shalom, shalom, uvracha, peace and blessings to you.